Good afternoon, everyone. I, I'm Jennifer Lee. I'm a family law barrister at Pump Court Chambers in London. I'll be speaking today on modern parenting in the 21st century, more specifically on surrogacy. Um, I know some of you are experts in the field and will know um, this area extremely well. Um, some of you are perhaps uh, new to this and so would like to find out more about surrogacy, which I think is um, a hugely exciting area of law um, and has really stretched um, the traditional um, uh, normative concepts of what we think of as, as family law. Um, as family lawyers, it would be remiss in my view not to have some knowledge of this growing area, uh, which has given many thousands of intended parents the opportunity to have a family when um, it wasn't possible before. Um, so my aim today will be to give you a quick overview of surrogacy um, and to trot through some of the more recent developments. Um, there'll be time at the very end um, for some questions and, and don't worry about taking notes uh, because the slides will be circulated to all of you um, at the end of this talk. Um, right, so what is surrogacy? Uh, it, it was defined in the report of the uh, Committee of Inquiry into Human Fertilization and Embryology in 1984 um, as the practice whereby one woman carries a child for another with the intention that the child should be handed over at birth. And just to give you some historical context as well, um, <clears throat> the report was commissioned as a result of um, the famous baby cotton case uh, in the 1980s, some of you might recall. Um, the surrogate mother, Kim Cotton, had agreed to have a child for um, a, a couple who couldn't conceive on their own in the United States. Um, and, and the story caused huge controversy uh, and the child was made the subject of wardship proceedings in, in, in court. Um, the debate um, resulted in this 1984 report, which eventually led to the Surrogacy Arrangements Act of 1985, which is the, the bedrock the foundation of um, modern surrogacy as we know it. And, and under the 1985 Act, um, commercial surrogacy is illegal in the United Kingdom. It's a criminal offense to advertise either for a surrogate or to advertise to be a surrogate. Um, the Act remains in force today. So commercial payments or commercial brokering of surrogacy arrangements are, are, are not allowed in the United Kingdom and certainly surrogacy agreements or contracts are not enforceable. Um, the report um, also paved the way for the Human Fertilization and Embryology Act of 1990, which permitted surrogacy in the United Kingdom on an altruistic basis, uh, but allowing for reasonable expenses to be paid uh, to the surrogate. Um, at the time, um, uh, only married heterosexual couples could apply for parental orders. Um, this is the order which transfers parentage from the surrogate mother to the intended parents, the commissioning parents, and I'll come back to talk about parental orders in a moment. Um, reform came in April of 2010 in the form of the Human Fertilization and Embryology Act of 2008. Um, which extended the availability of parental orders to same-sex couples, whether married or in a civil partnership, uh, and also to partners uh, in an enduring family relationship, so whether or not same-sex or heterosexual. Uh, further reform came in 2019, uh, removing discrimination between applicants um, when Parliament passed uh, legislation to allow single biological parents uh, of children born through surrogacy to apply for parental orders. Uh, and that followed um, a, a high profile case decided by the former president, Sir James Munby, uh, called Reset in 2015 and 2016, um, brought by a biological father of a child born following surrogacy, who argued um, that the law was discriminatory and interfered uh, with their rights to private and family life. And the court um, agreed um, that the court decided that the law was incompatible, granted a declaration of incompatibility, uh, which then led parliament to amending the law in 2019. 
Um, there are essentially two types of surrogacy. Um, there's partial or traditional surrogacy, which involves an egg from the surrogate, which is then fertilized, usually by the sperm from the intended or commissioning father. Um, the second type is full or gestational surrogacy, which involves the implantation of an embryo created using either the eggs and sperm of the intended parents, a donated egg fertilized with sperm from the intended father, uh, or indeed uh, an embryo created using donor eggs and sperm. Um, and so in total surrogacy, the surrogate mother has no genetic link with the child. Um, I should also explain that actually, obviously, the, the term intended parents or commissioning parents uh, is often used to describe the parents with whom the child is to be placed post-birth with the intention that the child should become their child. Um, uh, I think it's fair to say that surrogacy has become uh, more and more mainstream with high profile uh, celebrity surrogacy arrangements hitting the headlines. We see um, Elton John and David Furnish there with their two children uh, born by surrogacy in 2011 and 2013. Um, Lucy Liu with her child, born via surrogacy in 2015, and uh, of course, more recently, uh, Tom Daly and uh, his husband in 2018. Um, these high profile stories um, have undoubtedly put surrogacy in the spotlight. Um, occasionally, however, we do hear of surrogacy arrangements which have gone wrong. We hear of tales of exploitation. Uh, of surrogates, particularly overseas. Um, we hear of um, families, clients stuck in foreign jurisdictions, unable to return to the United Kingdom with their child due to visa or other issues. Um, we've heard of the scandal, I'm sure many of you um, well know, um, the scandal concerning baby Gammy in 2014-15, um, who has Down syndrome. Um, and was said to have been left behind in Thailand with his surrogate whilst his intended parents, uh, who were Australian, took uh, his healthy twin sister back to Australia. Um, it then also turned out um, that the intended father was a convicted child sex offender. Um, the push for greater transparency in the family court overseen uh, by the former president have also undoubtedly led to a greater number of reported cases concerning surrogacy, bringing this area to the attention of practitioners, which um, uh, can only be a good thing. Um, ultimately, um, in my view, there can be no doubt that surrogacy is increasingly seen by many prospective parents up and down the country. Um, people who have fertility or other medical issues, um, same-sex couples who cannot conceive um, uh, on their own as a real and viable route to parenthood and possibly an easier uh, route to parenthood compared to adoption. Um, statistically, we know that there has been increase year on year in the number of people applying for parental orders, um, which is a, a good indicator um, of the rise in, in surrogacy arrangements. Um, figures released by CAFCAS um, have shown a steady increase uh, in the number of such applications. Um, in 2008, um, you can see that there were just 67 applications received, um, only one of which involved an international surrogacy arrangement. Uh, fast forward 10 years, and in 2018, there were over 280 applications logged. Uh, with the highest proportion of those involving um, surrogacy in England um, at nearly 43%, uh, percent, followed by arrangements uh, in the United States. Um, the figures have continued to increase despite the pandemic, and so for practitioners, um, certainly it would be quite remiss uh, not to equip ourselves with at least a working knowledge uh, of this area. Um, the figures I gave you earlier are the official figures from CAFCAS uh, of the number of parental order applications. Um, however, we know um, there are still unknown numbers of children in this country um, born via surrogacy whose parents simply never applied to regularize their status for um, uh, numerous reasons, um, some of which um, 
would come down to is essentially ignorance of the law. Um, these are children who are sitting on what uh, Mrs. Justice Thais um, described in one case as a ticking time bomb because um, these children and their intended parents um, essentially left in a very precarious position indeed. And, and what I mean by that, if I may, just coming back to some basics, um, under English law, the woman who gives birth to the child is always regarded as the child's mother and will automatically have parental responsibility. And even if the birth mother is a gestational surrogate with no genetic link, she will be the birth mother. Um, and so the surrogate cannot simply surrender her parenthood um, and parental responsibility. She can't simply say, you know, I will give you my parenthood and PR to the intended parents. Um, that can only come about by um, uh, the making of a relevant court order. Um, if the surrogate is married or in a civil partnership, um, then the surrogate spouse or partner would be the other legal parent, unless it can be shown that the husband, spouse, partner did not consent to the placing in the surrogate of the embryo or the sperm and eggs or to the surrogate's artificial insemination. Um, if the surrogate is not married or in a civil partnership, um, or if the spouse stroke civil partner did not consent to the arrangement, then in most cases, the intended father, the commissioning father, will be the, the other legal parent in addition to the surrogate, assuming he is not, uh, sorry, assuming he is also the biological father of the child. <clears throat> Alternatively, um, this is where it gets slightly more complicated. Alternatively, if conception takes place at a fertility clinic, a licensed fertility clinic in the United Kingdom, someone else can be nominated as the second legal parent, normally the intended mother um, or the uh, non-biological father, provided appropriate forms are filled in after uh, the required counseling and before conception. Um, any other person in this arrangement um, does not acquire legal parenthood or parental responsibility until the relevant order is made. So um, this area can be hugely complicated and there are various pitfalls. Um, it underlines the importance of practitioners having a good working knowledge and really seeking specialist advice um, from practitioners in this area so they can avoid long lasting um, legal and practical difficulties for their clients down the road, some of whom um, may very well be tempted to enter into informal surrogacy arrangements without any legal advice. And um, you'll be surprised to know that um, uh, as practitioners, I have certainly seen uh, quite a lot of those. Um, coming on to parental orders, um, a, a parental order is a bespoke order for children born through surrogacy. Um, which permanently extinguishes the legal status of the birth parents, surrogate, um, and if she is uh, in a marriage or civil partnership, the spouse partner, and reassigns parenthood uh, on and bestows parental responsibility on the commissioning parents. Um, so the effect of the order is that in law, the child is for all purposes treated as the commissioning or intended parent's child, and not the child of any other person. Um, it is, in the words of Mrs. Justice Thais, a transformative order because it transforms the identity of the child and creates a permanent parent-child relationship between the commissioning intended parents and the child, which is uh, lifelong. Um, as the former president observed in um, a famous case called Re X, a child, surrogacy time limits, which um, I'll address in a moment. Uh, section 54 goes to the most fundamental aspects of status and transcending even status to the very identity of the child as a human being, who he is and who his parents are. A parental order has a transformative effect, not just in it, 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 on its effect on the child's legal relationships with the surrogate and the parents, commissioning parents, but also in relation to the practical and psychological realities of access identity. A parental order like an adoption order has an effect extending far beyond 
the merely legal. It has the most profound personal, emotional, psychological, social, and in maybe in some cases, cultural and religious consequences. So very, very profound indeed. Um, the criteria for making a parental order is set out in sections 54 and 54A of the um, 2008 uh, Act. The application can be made by one or two people, um, uh, both of whom must be aged at least 18. Um, it used to be um, that um, there had to be two uh, uh, applicants, um, but the law was changed on the 3rd of January of 2019 to allow single applicants um, with a biological link with a child, as I mentioned earlier, following the case uh, of Re uh, Z and the introduction of a new section 54A. Um, the applicant or one of the applicants, if there are two, must have provided the genetic material used to create the embryo. So an arrangement involving both donor sperm and eggs, which is obviously possible, um, whereby the intended parents would have no genetic link with a child, would presently fall outside the scope of this legislation. Um, the child must have been carried by a woman who is not the applicant or one of the applicants as the result of the placing in her of the embryo or sperm and eggs or her artificial insemination. Um, where two people apply for um, a parental order, the applicants must be husband and wife, civil partners of one another, or two persons living as partners in an enduring family relationship. Um, furthermore, at the time of the application and the making of the order, the child's home must be with the applicants, and either or both of the applicants or the applicant must be domiciled in, in the United Kingdom in the Channel Islands or the Isle of Man. Um, and um, over the years, the courts have, um, there have been numerous cases where the courts have come to look at all these criteria and we'll cover some of those in a moment. Um, the application must also be made within six months of the date of birth of the child. Um, now it used to be a fundamental assumption made by family lawyers that the court had no power to extend this time limit. But this changed um, in a case called Re-X a Child, um, which I'll come to in a moment. In fact, I referred to it earlier when um, I was quoting the former president. Um, no money or other benefit must have been given or received other than for reasonable expenses, unless the court authorizes such payments, which can be retrospectively given if appropriate. Um, the surrogate mother um, and um, her spouse or civil partner, if she has one, must also freely and with full understanding agree unconditionally to the order being made. Um, there is an important um, caveat here, which is that the agreement must be obtained no earlier than six weeks after the birth of the child. Otherwise, the consent would not be valid. Um, the court may dispense with such agreement in circumstances where the surrogate or spouse partner, if applicable, um, cannot be found or genuinely is incapable of giving agreement. Um, um, I, I mentioned um, that there has been a corpus of case law um, decided by the courts over the years looking at interpreting the criteria and applying the criteria sometimes in very novel situations. Uh, and I mentioned that it was a fundamental assumption that the court had no power to extend the six month time limit. Um, in the case of Rex, um, the time limit was in fact extended by some 20 months by the court because the making of a parental order was deemed ultimately to be in the, the best interests uh, of the child. Um, the court noted that the parents um, uh, who had been unaware they needed to apply for the parental order were not the legal parents and did not have parental responsibility for their child. And so the question for the court was whether um, it could read down the statute, um, which said, you know, there is a six month time limit, you must apply within six months of the child's birth. 
whether the court could read down that requirement and make a, a parental order. Um, in granting the order, the former president uh, observed that um, parliament uh, must have intended a sensible result. Um, it, could, it couldn't have intended that the gate should be barred um, for children and their parents forever, even if the application say was made one day late. Um, uh, the court, um, the, the president said, should look at the underlying purpose of the statute and in the case of a parental order, must consider the impact uh, on the applicants of breaching the time limit and importantly, the impact on the child whose welfare uh, would be the court's paramount concern. Um, having regard to the importance of the parental order and the rights of the child and parents under the uh, European Convention of Human Rights, Sir James Munby concluded uh, that the court was entitled to make an order after the six months had expired. Um, and Sir James Munby said this, every case will to a greater or lesser degree be fact specific. Um, in the circumstances of this case, the application should be allowed to proceed. No one, not the surrogate, not the commissioning parents, not the child will suffer any prejudice if the application is allowed to proceed. On the other hand, the commissioning parents and the child stand to suffer immense and irremediable prejudice if the application is halted in its tracks. Um, since REX, um, which was a very bold and creative judgment from the former president, um, it has paved the way for quite a bit of further judicial um, ingenuity in this field when interpreting and applying the criteria. And since this decision, there have been other cases where the six month time limit has been extended, um, including a case called A, B and C, D, decided in 2015 where the time limit was extended by three years. Um, and another case called A and B um, uh, in 2015, again, where the time limit was extended by over seven years. Um, I'll give you the um, citations for these authorities uh, later on, but um, uh, certainly worth bearing in mind that there is now uh, uh, certainly um, a great measure of flexibility for the courts. Um, XA Child Foreign Surrogacy decided in 2018 is another decision of Sir James Munby. Um, quite an interesting one. The applicants were a husband and wife, um, one of whom was gay. Um, he and the other uh, intended parent, um, his, uh, his wife, lived in separate homes um, and they described their relationship as platonic and not romantic. So um, did this satisfy the Section 54 criteria? Um, were the applicants married uh, for the purposes of the legislation? Um, the court said that the applicant's long-standing marriage complied with the requirements of the Marriage Act, um, was therefore, for all intents and purposes, a valid marriage. Um, the fact that it was, said Sir James Mumby, um, without a sexual component, um, the fact that it is a platonic and without a sexual component is neither here nor there, and in truth of no concern of the judges or of the state. A sexual relationship is not necessary for there to be a valid marriage. In short, a platonic marriage is still a, a valid marriage, and that must be right. Um, otherwise, most marriages, I would hazard a guess, after some time would become invalid. Um, but what about the question as to whether the child's home was with the applicants, given that the couple here lived in separate homes? Um, on that issue, the court said that the reality was that this child uh, did live with both parents in the wife's home and also in the husband's home. And so therefore a parental order could be made. Um, what about the issue of um, reasonable expenses? Now, if you, if you investigate this area, there, there have been so many cases on uh, what is meant by reasonable expenses, how the courts uh, approach payments over and above um, what is considered reasonable. Um, if more than reasonable expenses have been paid to the surrogate, um, the court cannot make a parental order unless it can be persuaded to retrospectively authorize uh, those payments. 
And in my years of um, practicing and, and dealing with um, parental order applications, I have yet to come across uh, a case where the applicants have failed in persuading a court uh, not to authorize payments, um, which are deemed uh, to be uh, over and above reasonable expenses. But of course, every case is fact specific and you can't uh, ever take this for granted. Um, in re X and Y, um, which is really the, a, a very important case you need to know about when it comes to reasonable expenses. Um, that case involved an English couple who had paid um, 235 euros a month to their Ukrainian surrogate during the pregnancy, and then a lump sum of 25,000 euros on the birth uh, of the child. And it was common ground um, that the expenses were not reasonable expenses, and so the question was whether the court should authorize those payments. Um, and Mr. Justice Headley um, noted that the statute offered no guidance on the issue. Um, and he concluded that when looking at this question, um, public policy considerations against commercial surrogacy were important and that the court should essentially look or ask itself three guiding questions. Was the sum paid disproportionate to reasonable expenses? Were the applicants acting in good faith and without moral taint um, in their dealings with the surrogate? Uh, and thirdly, were the applicants a party to any attempt to defraud uh, the authorities? A and the court held that what amounted to reasonable expenses uh, was a question of fact, um, uh, uh, certainly very fact specific. Um, here, uh, in this case, the applicants uh, were um, uh, found to have acted in good faith. There was no moral taint and no attempt uh, by them to defraud uh, the authorities. And they sought at all times to comply with uh, the relevant law. Um, so the court went on to find that the payments were not so disproportionate uh, that granting an order would contradict public policy. Um, uh, the payments were authorized and a parental order was made. Um, uh, this question was um, revisited in um, another quite famous case called Re A, B and C in 2016, which came before Miss uh, Justice Russell. Um, it, it concerned three applications for parental orders in respect of three children um, follow, following surrogacy arrangements entered into in this jurisdiction. And the key issue for the court was whether um, the expenses paid to the surrogates had been reasonably incurred. And in um, uh, considering that issue, um, Ms. Justice Russell observed that um, the law provides no tariff for expenses for UK surrogacy. So there is no limit, there is no you know, sort of set amount. Um, there is no universally acceptable figure to pay for surrogacy expenses in the UK, irrespective of the circumstances in law, whether it is 15,000 or more or less. Uh, and I've emphasized that part of her judgment. Um, in authorizing the payments, um, the court um, reminded itself that really the court should only refuse to make a parental order where there has been the clearest abuse of public policy, um, which Ms. Justice Russell says, um, uh, extends to welfare to ensure that commercial surrogacy agreements are not used to circumvent childcare laws in this country, resulting in the approval of arrangements in favor of people who would not otherwise be approved as parents on welfare grounds. Um, to, paraphrase, to paraphrase Hadley J, the court must be careful not to be involved in anything that looks like a payment for buying a child. Um, Moving on to one of the more recent um, cases, um, this was decided fairly recently um, by Mrs. Justice Thies. It's called REAX, a child parental order surrogacy arrangement. Um, very sad um, set of uh, circumstances. The commissioning parents um, in this case had difficulty conceiving on their own. Um, they entered into a surrogacy ar arrangement uh, in the United Kingdom with another couple. Um, the um, child was conceived in May of 2018 at a licensed uh, clinic using the intended father's sperm and the surrogate's eggs. 
Um, tragically, um, five months into the pregnancy, the intended father died. Um, the surrogate gave birth in early 2019 to X, the child, um, who has been in the care of the intended mother uh, uh, since, uh, since then. Um, now, the legal position at birth uh, is that the surrogate, the birth mother, um, is X's legal mother. Um, her husband, because she was married, was the legal father of the child. The intention had been that the intended commissioning parents would have gone on to apply for a parental order, but because of the death, unexpected death of the intended father, that caused huge um, complications. Um, the intended mother, who was now caring for the child, um, could not apply as a single applicant because although the law had changed to allow single parents to apply in uh, January of 2019, she was not eligible because she had no genetic link with the child. The eggs had come from the surrogate uh, and the sperm had come from her now deceased husband, the intended father. Um, it was recognized that although adoption could have been an option, it was far from ideal because although an adoption order would have extinguished the surrogates uh, and her husband's legal status um, and the intended mother would be the legal parent, it wouldn't have placed any recognition on the commissioning father, the intended father, um, who is this child's intended and biological father. Um, and this was a very crucial element of the case and the intended and biological father should be recognized as this child's father. Um, so the real issue for the court was the extent to which it could read down the requirements of the statute so that uh, it was compatible with the applicants and the child's convention rights. And cases such as REX time limit, um, the decision where the former president considered extending the time limit uh, were considered. Um, Mrs. Justice Thais found that Article 8 was engaged, that the child's right to a private life extended to ensuring that she was provided with recognition of her, her identity as the child of her deceased father. Um, Article 14 um, was also engaged because without a parental order, um, this child would not have a birth certificate which reflected her relationship and connection with, connection with her intended parents solely by virtue uh, of her birth through surrogacy. Um, and, and on that point, the court noted that had this child been born naturally to the intended parents, she would have had a legal connection with her now deceased father because there is provision um, under sections 39 and 40 of the 2008 Act, which provided for fathers to be recorded on birth certificates where the embryo transfer um, or artificial insemination had taken place posthumously. Um, and so in a similar vein to um, Sir James Munby in REX, uh, Mrs. Justice Thais determined that Parliament could not have intended this child to be excluded from such recognition um, and that Parliament had simply not considered this type of scenario uh, when the statute was um, created. Uh, crucially, um, she found that the proposed reading down of the statute would be in the spirit of, or would go with the grain of the legislation, um, with Parliament having indicated really that it you know, would seek to ensure that the law doesn't discriminate against different categories of applicants on the grounds of relationship status. And so she found that this proposed reading down would very much be in line with the spirit of that. Um, and the court was therefore able to read down the statute and grant the parental order to the intended mother and uh, the deceased father. Um, so having quickly cantered through um, uh, those cases, and I, those are really very much the tip of the iceberg, um, it's fair to say that um, there has been general acceptance by professionals working in this field that the law is now very much outmoded. Um, what was appropriate when the 1984 report was published is no longer fit uh, for purpose in the 21st century. And so the Law Commission has been looking at surrogacy law as part of its 13 program of law reform. Um, it's currently looking into it now. 
And one of the major areas for change is creating a, a new surrogacy pathway um, whereby intended parents uh, would become the legal parents of the child at the point of birth, provided certain requirements are met. So having to go through um, medical and criminal checks, receiving independent legal advice, um, implications, counseling, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so currently intended parents have to wait until the child has been born and then apply to the court to become the child's parents um, via uh, the application for a parental order, um, which can take months and it doesn't reflect the reality of the child's family life. It can also be fraught with difficulties as we've seen, making the process uncertain and, and, and une uneasy for both the intended parents and the surrogate. Um, the other proposal is allowing um, international surrogacy arrangements to be recognized here uh, automatically on a country by country basis. Uh, and so that would be very much um, to be left with, uh, as I understand it, up to the Secretary of State to make appropriate legislation looking at specific countries uh, and their arrangements there. Um, and thirdly, to create greater clarity uh, around uh, what payments can be made to a surrogate. The Law Commission is also proposing that um, the law allows a, a number of categories of payment that parents would be allowed to make to a surrogate. So for example, to cover lost earnings, um, essential and additional costs uh, of a pregnancy, compensation for pain and inconvenience. Um, so those types of categories uh, would be um, uh, allowed, um, uh, as it were, for payments uh, to a surrogate. Uh, but of course, the precise details um, we won't know for some time because the Law Commission has said it won't be producing its final report uh, and a draft bill until at least autumn of 2022. And I, I checked this last night and that remains the case. So there is cause for optimism though, and I know that those working in this field um, we'll be watching this very closely. Um, until then, we'll have to work with the existing framework uh, and rely on judges um, to creatively stretch uh, and apply the law to fit the individual circumstances of the case. Um, I've listed some um, resources and a couple of links which I'd recommend uh, you have a look at uh, when you have the time. There are some really helpful nonprofit organizations which I've listed there, uh, which um, provide a wealth of information on surrogacy, um, such as COTS, the Donor Conception Network, Surrogacy UK and Brilliant Beginnings. I I'd highly recommend you have a look at their websites. Um, and um, I think this brings me to the end of my talk. I've been told that uh, I should keep to the 40, 45 minute slot um, to allow time for questions. Um, I've, I've actually received a couple of um, uh, interesting questions, actually, and I'll, I'll deal with those now. Um, Natasha Atkins, thank you very much for your question. I'm very interested um, in what happens if the parent says they no longer want the baby from the surrogate and who would have parental responsibility, etc. cetera. Um, well, under English law, the surrogate would be the legal parent and have parental responsibility for the child until and unless a, a relevant order is made to extinguish the surrogate status. And if the surrogate is in a marriage or civil partnership, her spouse or civil partner would be in the same position, would be the second legal parent. And so unless it can be shown that the spouse or civil partner uh, did not consent uh, to the arrangement, uh, uh, whereby the surrogate uh, uh, the, uh, uh, did, did not consent to the arrangement uh, concerning the surrogacy. So parenthood and parental responsibility, to answer your question, would remain with the surrogate um, and the spouse uh, or civil partner, if relevant, um, which um, obviously creates real issues here um, if the surrogate and spouse partner doesn't want to have anything to do with the child. And in fact, we have come across cases where uh, this has happened. And we've also come across cases where uh, 
um, uh, uh, the reverse has happened where, and I'll, and I'll deal with this uh, separately in a moment because I think there's a related question to this where um, the, um, the spouse and the surrogate refuse to actually give consent to the commissioning parents um, having this child. So, you know, the arrangement is fraught with difficulties. It's commercial surrogacy arrangements. Surrogacy arrangements are not enforceable in the UK. And so I think this very much underlines uh, the call for reform. Um, the second question I've received um, is from Catherine Castles. Um, thank you very much, Catherine, for your question. Um, when the surrogate is married but estranged from her husband, what is the best way to deal with his legal status? Should the surrogate reach out to have express evidence of his lack of consent? Um, or if things are heated and the surrogate is concerned that he will not give express evidence of his lack of consent, should they say nothing and document his lack of involvement from the outset? Um, I, it, it's a really interesting question, and I obviously don't know what the exact situation is, whether we're talking about using a licensed clinic in the UK or overseas. Um, but when I sort of um, just off the top, top, top of my head, if you're using a licensed clinic in the UK, um, in rare cases where it can be shown that the surrogate spouse or civil partner does not consent, the surrogate can complete um, a, a relevant form. I think it's called a form LC um, to explain the circumstances. And so the form can't be used to routinely exclude a spouse from being the second legal parent, but it can be used to negate parenthood if the spouse genuinely does not consent to the arrangement. Um, so my view is that if you are using that route and you have to fill in this form, you would have to reach out um, to that husband, estranged husband, and evidence his lack of consent. Um, but I, I think more fundamentally, um, and again, I don't know the exact arrangements here, but my view is that if I were you, I'd be advising my client to steer clear um, of this arrangement and to find a different surrogate um, if you can, because you'd be storing up difficulties for your client further down the line, I would have thought, because if a parental order is required to extinguish the surrogate status and to transfer parenthood, presumably if there's a couple to your client and the um, client's partner, um, you would need the consent of the surrogate and her spouse to the making of a parental order. And if the spouse's husband doesn't give consent, then the courts have made it very clear that it cannot make a parental order, it cannot proceed. The court can only dispense with the consent of the spouse's husband if he cannot be found or if he genuinely is incapable of giving consent. I don't know, for example, if he's gone missing and all reasonable efforts have been made to locate him or if you know, he's lost capacity, um, something, something um, of that kind. But you know, if if the question is then asked of your client of the surrogate's estranged husband, and if he then pops up and says, actually, I don't consent, I think your client would be very much on a, on a very sticky wicket there. Not not to mention the child. Um, there's a case called Re A B surrogacy consent, and the citation is 2016 E W H C 2643. Um, 2016 EWHC 2643, um, a decision of Mrs. Justice Thies where the surrogate and her husband fell out with the intended parents. Um, they refused to give consent uh, to the commissioning parents for a parental order to be made, but at the same time wanted nothing um, to do with the child. And so the child remained with the commissioning parents but yet the surrogate and her husband refused to give consent. And the court said, you know, it was very, very unfortunate indeed, but the statute meant that it couldn't make parental orders because consent was not forthcoming. And so what it decided to do there was to adjourn the application for parental orders with liberty to restore in the hopes that the surrogate and her husband would change their minds further down the road. 
Um, the third question I've received is, um, if the surrogate is overseas, and again from Catherine, if the surrogate is overseas and a parental order is made in that jurisdiction and the child's birth certificate does not mention the husband, does the husband, I assume, of the surrogate still need to be included on the application as the respondent? Um, well, I think the starting point will be the family procedure rules, 13.3, um, which sets out those um, who are required to be named as respondents to the application for a parental order. Um, and so the respondents namely would be the birth mother, the surrogate, the other parent, um, if any. Um, so this would be the husband, um, uh, any other person in whose favor there is a provision for contact and any other person with parental responsibility. So the question would be whether um, the husband of the surrogate falls into any of the last three categories. And under English law, if the surrogate is married, wherever she might be, the husband would be the second legal parent, would he not? Because no orders have been made in this country to extinguish his legal status as the second legal parent. And irrespective of any foreign parental orders, I mean, un unless there is a parental order made by an English court, he would still be the father, the second legal parent and the father of this child. And so my view is that, Catherine, you would name him as the respondent in the application. Um, in any event, um, the family procedure rules allow for the court at any time to direct that any other person or body should be made a respondent. Um, and also that the respondent once named be removed from the proceedings anyway. So I think my view would be to name him. Um, if he needs to be removed further down the line, then so be it. And the court has power to do that.